Hi, welcome. I'm Adam Goodhart from the CV Star Center. And almost five years ago, gosh, time has flown, I first had the pleasure of welcoming Henry Winsick to Washington College for his, uh, the very first time here. And for the first of what I'm quite happy to say would be many, many visits. Henry had just, as many of you will recall, been given the Star Center's first ever Patrick Henry Writing Fellowship, a major award endowed through a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities to bring eminent historians to our campus for an entire academic year, and supported as well, I should say, by a major gift from the Nuttall family, descendants of the patriot Patrick Henry, hence the name of the fellowship. And hence how appropriate it was that our very first recipient of the fellowship is named Henry. <laughs> we still, we, we say that the, that, I don't know if he's named after the fellowship or if it's named after him, but it's kind of appropriate. So as I said, it was to bring eminent historians here, and Henry certainly was and is eminent. In fact, maybe even a little bit more eminent now than he was in 2008. Um, and his reputation, the, the reputation that he was built, was for scholarship that teases apart some of the tangled knots of America's racial history. His 1999 book, The Hairstons, An American Family in Black and White, won the National Book Critics Circle Award for Biography, and it tells the story of two extended Virginia families who share a surname and a legacy, although one is black and the other is white, and it traces this relationship back across the centuries. In 2003, Henry published An Imperfect God, George Washington, His Slaves, and the Creation of America, which was named best book of that year by the Society for Historians of the Early American Republic. And the book um, was a controversial one. It was even briefly blacklisted at Mount Vernon. Did you know that Mount Vernon blacklisted? There's a, it's a list there, apparently. I don't know. But uh, it wasn't for sale in the bookshop for a while. Woo! Anyway, um, but actually that book, far from vilifying George Washington as a slaveholder, for those of you who have read it, you, you know that it actually humanizes George Washington and, and ultimately, for, for me, led me to an even greater respect for Washington, um, for his moral vision, his social prescience, and his political leadership. If it's not heretical at Washington College to say you can have even greater respect for George Washington than you have already. And during his stay in Chestertown from the fall of 2008 through the spring of 2009, Henry worked on a new book that was similar to his Washington project in some respects, but very different in others. Master of the Mountain, Thomas Jefferson and His Slaves, which has just been published last fall by Farris Strauss and Giroux, offers a much darker portrait of an American founding father, as you are about to hear. And this book has been even more controversial, um, not blacklisted, I believe, at the Mount Vernon Bookshop, but drawing both ardent praise and vehement denunciation much farther afield. The Washington Post columnist Jonathan Yardley, whom, as you know, is known as one of the toughest, most unsparing critics in journalism, actually named Master of the Mountain one of the best books of the year 2012, while Laura Miller, book critic for Salon, called Henry Winsick's work a persuasive and devastating indictment and added, every American should read it. Meanwhile, some other scholars, including Annette Gordon-Reed, who was the winner of our very own George Washington Book Prize several years ago for her book on Jefferson and Sally Hemings, have blasted Master of the Mountain as supposedly an unfair distortion of our third president. And the controversy, as you may have seen, has spilled out of the usual book review pages and into the news sections of publications like the New York Times, the Chronicle of higher education, and other very prominent venues. Now, at the Star Center, watching this somewhat from the sidelines, um, of course, we've certainly not enjoyed reading some of the unfair, I think, criticism leveled at Henry's work, but we've been gratified by the debate that it sparked, and I believe it's fair to say from talking to Henry that he's been very gratified as well. Because Master of the Mountain isn't just about 200-year-old history, it raises unsettling questions still unsettling, as the controversy shows, that lie near the heart of our national identity, not just about race, but about profit and politics, about lofty ideals contrasted with brutal realities. 
The Star Center Fellowship that Henry won back in 2008 was designed to foster historical work that wouldn't just sit on library shelves to be consulted by half a dozen scholars, but would inspire broad public conversations about America's present and past. We're proud that Master of the Mountain was written in part in our very own custom house here in Chestertown, and we're even happier to welcome back someone who, together with his wife Donna, became a kind of honorary citizen of Chestertown during their stay here, and we hope there will be many return visits. Henry will be available um, after his talk. There will be copies of his book for sale and for signing over there in the corner, thanks to the redoubtable Shannon. And we invite all of you to uh, stay and, and buy a copy and chat with him a little bit. I see many friends of Henry here in the audience. Um, and with that, please join me in welcoming Henry Winsick back to Chestertown. Thanks, Adam. Uh, the Return of the Native. Uh, it, um, it, it really is a very distinct pleasure to be here. And I, it's almost an opportunity for a group hug because I see so many familiar faces. And when Donna and I came here, we felt so welcomed by the Chestertown community and by the Washington College community. I see Kitty and Birch, whom we met almost as soon as we arrived. I see Victor. I see all my, my friends from Queen Street, Joni and the Raymonds, every, so, many, so many faces. Um, I, I, so I'm not going to do an Oscar and go through every single name, but I do want to thank, I want to thank Adam, I want to thank Jennifer, I want to thank Michael. Um, they, they were the folks who put the Henry House together before Henry arrived, and I know that it was a tremendous amount of effort and struggle to get that ready, and then they welcomed Donna and me into, into that place and welcomed me into the Star Center. And I also owe a very big uh, hug to the Star Center and to Washington College. Uh, for the fellowship. It was a tremendous honor and a lifesaver to be chosen as the inaugural Patrick Henry Writing Fellow because the winter of 2008-2009 turned out to be the winter of my discontent. Not um, uh, at the beginning of it, in September, the stock market fell. Everybody was thrown into panic. And also, my book began to fall apart. Uh, and I, I desperately needed something to save this project, and it was the Star Center that came along and saved it. Uh, I don't know how you, how you folks who don't write think, book, think books get written, but it is, it is a titanic struggle, um, especially when you're dealing with someone as famous as Jefferson, who has been so, so uh, studied and so much written about, and there's so much to absorb about him. Uh, I had actually, uh, in order to get the fellowship, I had to turn in a substantial section of the manuscript. I think I sent Adam over like 125, 140 pages. Just before I arrived here in August, I sent my editor the first half of the book, about 250 pages. And, and a, a month after sending that in is when I really began to realize that the center would not hold. The book, it wasn't... It wasn't right, not because the writing wasn't good or because the structure wasn't good, though there were certainly problems there, but there were very, very unpleasant truths, very, very unpleasant facts that I had come across, which I had not yet honestly dealt with. And that led me to the very melancholy conclusion um, sometime in October that I would have to use this fellowship partly to build, but largely to tear apart, to break apart, to rip things, rip chapters into little sections, rip little sections into sentences, put them all back together again, write a new beginning, write whole new inter um, connecting sections, put myself more honestly into the book, express myself more honestly, because whenever one encounters things that are unpleasant, you try to hide. You try to disguise your own thoughts. You try to disguise your feelings. Make the reader feel better about things. And, um, and in this regard, I have to call out a special thanks to someone who is not here. It is Richard Ben Kramer, who gave me some very, very crucial advice. He said, Henry, if you're having trouble with this, if you're having rough material to present, put it up front. Put it in the first chapter. He said, your first chapter is your contract with the reader. Uh, and he and I had a number of discussions, and I want to thank Joni Kramer, who was so generous to me and so hospitable to Donna and me, having us over for evenings and coming over to the Star Center for these agitated conversations about what we do about the stuff that Henry's found about Mr. Jefferson. Um, and Richard really helped propel the book on to, that, uh, to, to the reconstruction phase. Um, and I, without further ado, I would like to read a short section of the, of the book, 
uh, and then get into some of the material that has caused Annette Gordon-Reed and others to throw their bricks at me. Um, I, and someone, <laughs> when we got here to Chestertown, someone said to me, you've picked the right place to write a book about, Je about Jefferson. You, you, you had to get out of town. You know, I live in Charlottesville. So, um, <laughs> but uh, at any rate, uh, the last time I, I, gave, a, I gave a talk uh, at the end of my, my, my tenure here, as just as I read a section that said a thunderstorm loomed, a thunderstorm that erupted outside the window and lightning uh, crashed and thunder, I, there's no mention of thunder in this section. So, and it's, ju it's just a couple of pages. This originally actually was going to be the beginning of the book, uh, and I pushed it back to almost towards the end, but it still remains one of my favorite sections of the book, and it's, uh, the title is a quotation. The title is, The Effect on Them Was Electrical. At its extreme edge, American idealism, with its relentless pursuit of justice, induces a kind of giddiness. One such act of American idealism and justice unfolded in the following manner. On the first day of April in 1819, a group of 17 slaves left a plantation in the mountains south of Charlottesville, not far from Monticello, bound for a distant destination. They had been forbidden to carry much baggage and had been told they could take only things that they could use on a journey. A black man, a fellow slave, was in charge of them. Now, it was not at all unusual for slave drivers to be black men, and this caravan would not have excited much notice at a time when the roads of Virginia were full, full of, quote, gangs of Negroes, some in irons, on their various ways to slave markets. This group of five adults and 12 children had not been told where they were going. Riding in wagons, the slaves headed west across the Blue Ridge, then turned north to follow the Great Wagon Road, which is today's I-81, up the Valley of Virginia. Along the way, a white man galloped up to check on the party's progress. He was their master, a wealthy, politically prominent Virginian. Several of the slaves fell ill, which delayed the party, so the owner rode ahead. In Maryland, the wagons turned west along the National Road, today's Route 40, reaching the Monongahela River after a trek of some 280 miles. The master had arrived at the Monongahela ahead of his slaves, and there he purchased two flat bottom boats, 60 feet long and 12 feet wide, on which he ordered the slaves to embark. Because his people were all mountain folks who knew nothing of boats, the owner hired a, a river pilot, a white man, but had to put him off at Pittsburgh because the man was constantly drunk. At Pittsburgh, the Monongahela joins the Ohio River, the great water route to the west, and a dividing line between slavery and freedom. On its left bank lay Virginia and then Kentucky, both slave states, while on the right stretched the shores of Ohio, which was free. As the master later remembered, the landscape seemed extraordinarily beautiful that April under a bright sun and a cloudless sky, and he chose that panorama for an announcement. He ordered the boats to be stopped and lashed together, assembled the people, and made them a short address. And this is what he remembered. I proclaimed in the shortest and fullest manner possible that they were no longer slaves, but free, as free as I was, and were at liberty to proceed with me or to go ashore at their pleasure. The master later wrote that the effect on them was electrical. The people stared at him and then each other, as if doubting the accuracy or the reality of what they had heard. A profound silence settled upon them. Then, as they slowly grasped the truth and the reality of what they had heard, they began to laugh. He said it was a kind of hysterical, giggling laugh. And then they cried. And then they fell again into silence. And then he wrote, after a pause of intense emotion, bathed in tears, they gave vent to their gratitude and implored the blessing of God. The owner had a further announcement. He said that in recompense for their past services to him, Upon their arrival at their, their destination, which would be the free state of Illinois, he would give each head of family 160 acres of land, and he would settle near them. To this, all protested and said that they would continue to work for him until they had paid for their own emancipation. But he refused. He said that he had, quote, thought much of my duty and of their rights, and had made up my mind to restore to them their immediate and unconditional freedom, that I had long been anxious to do it. And in fact, when they reached Illinois, he gave them the deeds to the land and settled near them. Now, the emancipator was Edward Coles, a 32-year-old member of a very prominent Virginia family. Dolly Madison was his cousin. And among the Virginians whom the Coles family counted as friends and patrons were Patrick Henry, 
James Monroe, James Madison, and Thomas Jefferson. Now, in the massive landscape of slavery, the emancipation of 17 people may not seem very significant, but its symbolism was and is enormous. That emancipation was regarded as a cornerstone of the foundation of Illinois. To this day, a painting of the event, hang, uh, event on the river hangs in the Capitol Rotunda in Springfield, Illinois, entitled Future Governor Edward Coles Freeing His Slaves While en Route to Illinois. Indeed, Coles ran for governor of the state in specifically to beat back attempts to turn Illinois into a slave state, and he narrowly won. The event is also significant because it was preceded by a debate between Coles and Thomas Jefferson about freeing the enslaved people, and Thomas Jefferson told Coles not to do it. Uh, this is one of the things that the Jeffersonians call paradoxes and contradictions. Uh, here is uh, a, a man named Edward Coles, a member of the younger generation of Virginians, who came to Jefferson and said in, eight, in 18, uh, 17, 18, 18, before he embarked on this trip, sir, you wrote the Declaration of Independence. You served as our president. You are the apostle of liberty. It is your duty to get out in front of a, plan, of a program to emancipate slaves in Virginia. Jefferson refused, and he, and he just tried to discourage Coles from freeing any of his own slaves. Now, how is that? I mean, we, 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 uh, we look at Jefferson as the apostle of liberty and the man who said well, all men are, cre are created equal. Uh, so this is one of the, the paradoxes that, and contradictions that drew me into writing about Jefferson. Uh, and in the course of my research, I began to find that the paradoxes were really not so paradoxical after all. And the contradictions were not so contradictory after all. If you do something very simple, you put Mr. Jefferson on a timeline, which is the same thing I'd done for Washington. You put his actions and his statements on a timeline, you arrange everything chronologically, and you see if a pattern emerges. And lo and behold, one did. Uh, Je Washington's pattern was towards emancipation. Jefferson's pattern was away from it. And I could uh, pinpoint certain events in his life that, um, that reinforced that, that, that pattern. The young Jefferson is the man that we sort of have enshrined in our imaginations today. He was a passionate, a fiery advocate of emancipation. In the 1760s, as a young member of the House of Burgesses in, in, in Virginia, he submitted through a relative an emancipation plan. Uh, it was shouted down by all the slaveholders, and, and the proposer was called an enemy of his country. Uh, but Jefferson did not give up. A few years later, in the run-up to the revolution, he wrote a document called the Summary View, which gathered together uh, some of the, some points he wanted to present to other colonists and to the king. It was a summary of the rights of the colonists. And in that, he made an astonishing statement. He said, as soon as we can end the international slave trade, we can proceed to the enfranchisement of the slaves we have. Now, enfranchisement is a legal term. It means give the rights of citizenship to. Here is Thomas Jefferson, a lawyer, a legislator, uh, a patriot, who is using a very powerful word. We are going to make these people into citizens. Well, that unfortunately didn't go anywhere, but he didn't give up. In the de Declaration of Independence, he wrote, all men are created equal. Now, many of us think that we're supposed to silently insert the word white in front of all men, but that's not true. If we go back to the original hearers, we can get some sense of the original intent. And now, I'm not alone in this interpretation. A number of people say that when Jefferson wrote that, he meant to include the, the people of African descent. The state of Massachusetts based its constitution, state constitution, on the declaration. And it included that language, all men are created equal. And so in that same document, it said, slavery is hereby prohibited because it is a direct contradiction with all men are created equal. It's interesting when you look at the state constitutions for six southern states, which also absorbed Jefferson's language, all men are created equal, into their preambles. They had to change it. In those constitutions, it says all free men are created equal. Because they knew what Jefferson meant, and they tried to nullify his intent within their borders, and then they, su they succeeded in doing that. A few years later, Jefferson, as a member of the Continental Congress, drafted an extraordinary piece of legislation which would have changed our history. It was language for the Ordinance of 1784. In it, he said, he sort of drew a bright red line along the western edge of the then existing United States. And he said, okay, now it's, in this year it's 1784. 
After 1800, there will be no slavery in any territory that we organize west of that line. That would have included the future states of Mississippi and Alabama. It failed by one vote. The legislator from New Jersey was uh, sick that day. And so the bill, that, that language failed to get into the ordinance of 1784. And you can imagine how different our history would be if that, that had actually passed. And that was Jefferson's idea, Jefferson's proposal. Now, uh, the next stage in his life is his visit to France. We think of, when we think of Jefferson in France, we think that he went over there to savor French wine, to learn about French architecture, and to learn about French cuisine, and to embark on some kind of a relationship with Sally Hemings. Actually, he was over there as our trade representative. Uh, he, he had very, very serious business to conduct. And he carried a number over in his head, 30 million. That was the value of our annual exports in tobacco to Europe. All of that was raised by forced labor. And we really, really needed that money to pay off our uh, debts to British merchants. Southern planters were still very deeply in debt after the war. They were shocked that the revolution did not erase those debts, and even more shocked when they found out that the British merchants had been adding interest for the entirety of the revolution. And Jefferson himself was in that situation. He owed a great deal of debt. Uh, and the, 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 the country was raising as much tobacco as it could to send over there to raise the cash to, uh, to pay off this debt. Uh, and Jefferson was there to negotiate most favorable nation status or something like that with the French court. Um, we are now a superpower, but then we were not. Then we were an emerging nation with a human rights problem. Jefferson, uh, Jefferson soon found out that all of our great friends at court, the most influential people who, would, who were in a position to help us with these trade agreements, they were all abolitionists. Some of them had actually fought, had worn the uniform, to win the, the independence for the United States. And they said to him, they, we cannot understand how you have kept slavery. Lafayette said, I would never have drawn my sword in the American cause if I knew that you were going to preserve slavery. Jefferson began making all kinds of promises. We're on the verge of emancipating the slaves. This is going to happen, that's going to happen. Some of this was true, some of it was half true, some of it was not true. But we can begin to see Jefferson the slaveholder, Jefferson the diplomat, Jefferson the politician beginning to wobble. He has that 30 million in his head. He has his own debt in his head. He begins to blame his own slaves back at Monticello for, for his own debt. It's a, an extraordinary thing. It's what we would call blaming the victim. He had inherited a debt uh, when he married his wife, Martha, who died in 1782. Her father had made a bet on the slave market. When the market was going up, he made a deal with a, a, a London trading firm to buy a boatload of Africans, have them delivered to Virginia. He distributed the, those slaves uh, acro you know, across Virginia to these wealthy owners, and then the market fell. It's very much like today. Prices went down. And so when he submitted his bill, the bosses, the owners, were not at home. Or they said, send me another one in a few months or in a few years. So this guy, John Wales, one of those wholesale chaps, as they called him, uh, was on the hook for hundreds of thousands of pounds to the big boys in London, you know, their, our, our, their version of Wall Street. And they hounded him relentlessly, and the poor man died. Uh, Jefferson inherited that debt. It had, and, and then he, he wrote to his manager back at Monticello. He said, you must ex extract, quote, extraordinary exertions from those people because most of my debt was incurred in their purchase. Well, that's not true. Their debt with uh, he, the, the slaves that he inherited from John Wales came to him free and clear of debt. The slaves that, that were the cause of the debt had all been given to the elite planters of Virginia. They were gone. But Jefferson had this magical thing going in his head. If you were black, then you were sort of communally responsible for anything that any black person had done. So because the Wales slaves whom, who were sold had brought about this debt, it, it, actually it wasn't even them, it was Wales. He bet on the market and lost. That was the debt that Jefferson uh, ha had inherited, but he blamed, he blamed his slaves, and this sort of eased his conscience uh, a little bit. But he came under so much pressure in France, and he was still wobbling on this issue, that he left with the notion, that he, de he declared to his friends and to, an and to an abolitionist that when he got to back to Virginia, he was going to free his slaves. He was going to import German farmers, sharecroppers, and settle them alongside Monticello slaves on patches of land that he would give them. He would provide them with livestock and tools. 
And the point was that the Germans would help train the slaves to become self-reliant, independent uh, people. Uh, and Jefferson concluded this, this written plan saying, saying that he had no doubt that these slaves would become good citizens. There's that word again, citizens. Enfranchisement, he is still thinking of weaving that African American people have some place in the American fabric. But when he returned to Virginia in 1790, that plan went out of his head. The first thing that happened to him is his daughter announced that she was getting married to a cousin, Colonel Thomas Mann Randolph, and she needed a dowry. He didn't have much ready cash, but he had land and he had slaves. Uh, slaves, owning, the ownership of slaves was a good way to transfer wealth from one generation to another. So he set up his daughter as a slave mistress. He gave her, as he, call, as he wrote it, 25 Negroes, little and big, uh, to form a kind of financial bulwark. The other thing that he did is he embarked on a major reorganization of Monticello, the land and the house. He decided that he was going to abandon tobacco planting and shift into wheat. Now, for those of you who are not farmers, this is something I had to learn. I'm not a farmer. It, uh, shifting from one crop to another is not simply a matter of buying different seeds at the store. Uh, this was, it was a tremendous shift in, in uh, the organization of the enslaved workers uh, and in the whole culture of slavery at Monticello. And this was going on here. It was going on across the Chesapeake region. Tobacco was raised by gangs of laborers going out into the fields, all doing the same repetitive task over and over again, under the gaze and the lash of an overseer. Wheat required a great variety of very highly skilled professionals, people who, you know, who could uh, build wagons, uh, fabricate and maintain mechanical devices like uh, threshing machines, make plows and repair them. It required a large number of slaves whom you could trust because there was a lot of wagoning going back and forth, a lot of collecting of cash and dispersing of, of valuable items. So the whole system had to be reorganized. And lo and behold, the slaves adapted with amazing rapidity. This must have surprised Jefferson because he was always going around saying how, st saying how stupid slaves were. He said that they were incompetent, that they couldn't plan, that if you let them go, they would be thievish, that they had very bad character. And lo and behold, this change takes place, and he begins reporting that he was growing these extraordinarily great crops. Uh, and in 1796, one of his friends from France pays a visit to Monticello and is astonished by what he sees. He sees a beautifully functioning plantation with these very highly skilled enslaved people carrying out all of these tasks. Everything seems to be running beautifully. He writes, every article is made on Jefferson's farm. His Negroes are cabinet makers, carpenters, masons, bricklayers, smiths. The children he employs in a nail factory, which yields a considerable profit. And the young and old Negresses spin the clothing for the rest. Now, if you go on the Monticello website, you can find a list of like 26 different occupations that the slaves held. Some of them are, I won't read them all, basket makers, joiners, cabinet makers, sawyers, wheelwrights, nail makers, tinsmiths, spinners, weavers, dyers, seamstresses, brick makers, shoe makers. All of these have been documented. And the Frenchman says, you know, no, he doesn't say, but you can it, it sense it from his account, that a, a tremendous watershed has been reached. The, slave, the, the skills and the loyalty of the slaves is on full display. Is this the moment to set them free? Because all the objections that Jefferson has raised about the character of the African American people have been satisfied. But no, the conversation turns to color. We can't free these people, Jefferson says, because their color is different from ours. If we free them, our blood will mix and one will stain the other. And at this point, an air of unreality settled over the, the, uh, the conversation because the Frenchman and his entourage could see that Monticello was staffed by slaves who were so light-skinned that some of them barely looked African. And yet Jefferson pr professed to dread an event which had already taken place. So this is one of the occasions when you realize that we can't believe what Jefferson says. His pronouncements are at, are at complete odds with the reality on the ground. We can document this. And so this, this is one of the things that led me to think, you know, all of these scholars who quote Jefferson as, as quote Jefferson sayings as evidence of this and evidence of that and evidence of that, why do they believe it? Because we've now been studying, not just me, but others have been studying life at Monticello for so many years. We've, uh, we've unearthed a lot of information showing that Jefferson, who, who wants to use the word lie, but I mean that Jefferson was, was let's say, inaccurate. Um, another thing was taking another less obvious process 
was taking place at, at Monticello uh, at the, in, in the 1790s. And it was this that turned out to be the centerpiece of the book, and it was this that I put in the first chapter at Richard's recommendation, and it was this that, it, that really enrages the Jeffersonians, even though what I'm quoting comes directly from Mr. Jefferson himself. The, uh, looking through the financial records, I can see that uh, Jefferson was among the people who were pioneering the financialization of slavery. He was, as I mentioned before, that the ownership of slaves was a really good way to, to convey wealth for, them, uh, for, the, for the masters from one generation to the next. Jefferson and others were beginning to see how you could turn this ownership of slaves into cash. Jefferson wrote in 1794 to a neighbor, to a neighbor's family, after they had suffered financial reverses. He said, if you have any, f any money left, and put every farthing of it into land and Negroes. His words were, invest in Negroes. They show a silent profit by the increase in their value of from 5 to 10% a year. One of the things that most riles the Jeffersonians is that he also said, he calculated in a profit and loss memo for Virginia plantations, that the black population increases at 4% a year. He was counting the babies. He said, I allow, not, I allow nothing for losses by death but I will presently take credit 4% a year for their increase in keeping up their own numbers. And he said he made this observation at, at Monticello. No one had ever quoted that before I did. And no one had ever quoted that 5 to 10% business before I did. And the Jeffersonians really don't like it. And they say, well, that's not really what he was all about. And I said, well, what else was he about? This is, this is it, later on in life, he talked about how the breeding women on Mo, at Monticello gave a, had a baby every two years and it was in addition to his capital. The other thing I came across was that when, you know, when he was revitalizing the mansion itself, which he wanted to turn into a modern building uh, in, along French lines, bigger, uh, as I said, more modern with the, that magnificent dome over the top, he needed a lot of money to do that. He had gotten his debts under control. He was able to manage his payments, but he decided to take on more debt to enlarge Monticello and also to pay for some of his agricultural improvements. How would he do that? How would he raise cash? He wrote to a merchant banking house he had done business with in Amsterdam and said, would you take 150 American slaves as collateral for a loan? And they said yes. So he bundled and collateralized 150 people sent the title over to Amsterdam, and they sent a letter to a merchant banking house in Philadelphia opening a $2,000 line of credit, what we might call today a slave equity loan, and Jefferson drew upon that money to rebuild Monticello and build the mansion that we see today when we go and visit it. That was built with human capital, with human equity. Jefferson was one of the, he didn't start this, but it's, this is one of the points that I'm trying to make in this book is that through Jefferson, we illuminate that era. Sometimes people say to me, well, how can you say these things? He was just a man of his times. And I say, precisely, precisely. We learn of his times through him. He illuminates them. We learn why slavery survived the revolution and why it thrived. He was living already in a post-revolutionary era. Idealism, sent the sense of justice, was very rapidly burning out. That's not me saying it, it's Jefferson. It's George Washington. Jefferson said, from the moment this war is over, we will be going downhill. And he said, the shackles that we do not throw off will grow heavier. George Washington in 1780 wrote a very melancholy letter to one of his aides whom he had sent down to South Carolina and Georgia to try to get those legislatures to endorse a plan to free slaves and, and have them serve in the American army because we desperately needed more troops to fend off a British invasion. Alexander Hamilton worked on this plan. He said, we will give them their freedom with their muskets. But it failed. And Washington wrote a very melancholy assessment about that. And he said, that spirit of sacrifice, which at the beginning, well, that spirit of liberty, which at the beginning of this war would have sacrificed anything to its attainment, has long since subsided. And every selfish passion has taken its place. And he's speaking specifically about slavery now. He said, it is not the public interest, but the private interest that influences most of mankind, and Americans can no longer boast to be an exception. It was a very harsh judgment, and I think it was an accurate one, because he was also talking about himself. He had lost his the feeling of urgency to free slaves. His army, was said, it was said, was laying the foundation for the emancipation of slaves throughout America, because it was so integrated. 
in 1782, as the war was still officially going on, the Virginia House of uh, the uh, Virginia General Assembly passed an astounding uh, emancipation law. They said you can now free slaves at will. You don't have to get legislative approval anymore. And there was a burst of emancipation of manumissions, and then it subsided. Uh, as Jefferson said, when we get back to the business of making money, things are going to change. And Jefferson person personified that. Um, in the in the 1790s, he began to see the financial benefits uh, and, and began to write about the financial benefits of of, of owning slaves. Um, this, his point of view, his thinking was consistently challenged by people who remembered the old Jefferson, rem remembered the revolutionary Jefferson, the you know the apostle of liberty and the man who championed um, uh, uh, you know the, the, the man who championed freedom even for the slaves. Uh, in 17, around the same time that Edward Coles was freeing his slaves, Jefferson received an amazing document. His old revolutionary friend, Thaddeus Kosciuszko, died in Europe, and Jefferson was the executor of his will. Jefferson received this document. Jefferson knew what was in it because he had helped write it in 1795. The document was handed to him, and in it, it, it he realized that he was handed between seventeen and $18,000 to free as many Monticello slaves as that would buy and to settle them on land with all the equipment and livestock that they, that they needed. This, is the ch this was the chance for Jefferson to do exactly what he had been saying in a number of occasions he would do, that he would sacrifice anything to emance the cause of uh, emancipation. But he walked away from it. And I wonder why would he do that? And when you put that refusal to emancipate these people together with his sense of the tremendous cash value and the investment value of holding on to these slaves, you begin to understand why he walked away from that money. These slaves were too valuable as an investment. They were also too valuable in another way. I began to think, well, whom would he free? Who was ready to go? I thought, well, maybe he, he certainly could have freed John Hemings and his wife Priscilla. But John, John Hemings could read and write. And John Hemings had a trade. He was a cabinet maker and a joiner. But John Hemings made what Jefferson called the finest woodwork in America. He was working at that moment on Jefferson's new mansion at Poplar Forest. Was he going to set this man free, who did the finest woodwork in America? Um, well, what about his wagoner, uh, Davy Hearn? Uh, this is the man whom he trusted. He was a highly skilled man. He was, you know, carried um, uh, valuable cargoes and cash back and forth. Uh, he could go free. And then what about Joe Fawcett? Joe Fawcett was his chief blacksmith. Very, you know, very important, very highly skilled. He could have gone free and supported himself. But would Jefferson want to lose his chief blacksmith and his most trusted wagoner? And the other thing is, he wouldn't have wanted to lose their wives. Joe and David were married to his cooks. And now with the word cook is kind of misleading. These two women, uh, Edith Fawcett and, and Frances Hearn, had been trained by French professionals in the White House when they were teenagers. They spent years working in the White House kitchen, learning from professional French chefs. At Monticello, they cooked ev every day meals in the French style for, uh, let me back up just a little bit, Fra Frances and Edith worked in concert with the black butler, Burl Colbert, and the black head gardener, all both of them slaves, Wormley Hughes, running a, an enormous culinary operation. Uh, the, the, Jefferson, the core of the Jefferson family was 14 people, Jefferson and his extended family. And so they had to be fed two and a half meals a day. Uh, and then uh, they usually had visitors. The minimum number of people who had to be fed was about 20 every day. 30 was not unusual. And on one occasion, they fed 50. So what these people and their staffs were running was essentially a mid-sized luxury hotel. Now, would Mr. Jefferson want to set these people free? Of course not. So that, that it, through, through this, this will, we get a prism of understanding how important these slaves had become, begun, had, be, had become to him and how, in a way, the slaves had condemned themselves by becoming so skilled by, by, be, by making so much money, by being so loyal, they tightened the bonds of their own enslavement, making it very, even less likely that they could ever get away. Now, the, um, the Jeffersonians have challenged me on this well. They say, well, later it was found to be defective. But yes, but Jefferson didn't think it was defective. He said, this will will stand. The other claimants who, uh, who rose up in Europe, he said, th their claims will be dismissed. 
this money will be distributed in Virginia, just not by me. Uh, he didn't want to do it. Um, I, I would like to leave some time for, for questions, but what I want to do is to close with some of the language that Kostrzysko wrote in the will because it is very Jeffersonian, and it takes us back to the theme that I sounded at the beginning. This is what notions of, of justice and idealism sound like. I beg Mr. Jefferson that in case I should die without will or testament, he should buy out of my money so many Negroes and free them that the remaining sum should be sufficient to give them education and provide for their maintenance. That is to say, each should know the duty of a citizen of, in the free government, that he must defend his country against foreign and internal enemies. He must have good and human heart, sensible for the sufferings of others. Each, each one freed must be married and have a hundred acres of land with instruments and cattle for tillage and know how to manage it and govern it as well as, how, as, well as how to behave to neighbors always with kindness and ready to help them. Themselves frugal, to their children, give good education. I mean as to the heart and the duty to their country. And the one thing that Kostrzysko wanted in return, he said, in gratitude to me, and in this he invokes the declaration, in gratitude to me to make themselves as happy as possible. Uh, and I will close on that note, and I would be happy to take any questions that anyone might have. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have, are we going to use mics or just point and talk? Okay. Just repeat the question if you would. Okay, sure. Right over here, sir. Okay. Uh, when you knew Jefferson, what did the slaves have to do with the founding of the University of Virginia? How were they utilized in that founding? He asked how the slaves were used in the founding of, of, of the University of Virginia. Um, Je when Jefferson wrote the regulations for the university, he forbade uh, he, the students from having their own slaves on grounds uh, because he thought that slavery corrupted the, the masters and taught them how to be, uh, taught them brutality. Um, but th th there's actually a lot of research going on right now at UVA uh, about the lives of the, of, of, of the slaves. Just a few, a few weeks ago, I was giving a talk in a part of Virginia I can't mention, um, and someone whose name I can't mention came up to me and handed me previously unknown photographs of one of Jefferson's slaves who had worked at the university. Uh, so we're still, and, and the reason I have to be so secretive is that the owner said, please don't release any information about this, and I'm trying to do research on, this, on these photographs and this person to, in order to persuade this person to go public with this stuff and put it on the UVA website. But um, researchers at UVA are doing a lot of work to try to figure out exactly what the slaves did. They did a lot of labor to build the, um, the, the, the academical village, the buildings on the lawn and the rotunda, making the bricks and, and things like that. This would be a very interesting campus to really formulate the whole answer to this. Yes, oh yeah, yes. Okay, we moving this way, yes sir. Uh, what happened to Kostrzysko's money? Eventually, Oh, yes. What happened to Kostrzysko's money? Um, in 1853, the, su the Supreme Court decided that the European wills were actually the, 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 the wills that, that should be honored. And so the money went to a European heir. Um, but the, the interesting thing is that just after Jefferson, well, I think when Jefferson was actually still alive, the European claimants lost their first case. And the administrator came back to Jefferson and said, what should we do about this? Because this was an opportunity for Jefferson to reinstate himself as the executor and lay claim to that money. And I, I'm per completely convinced that if he had pushed forward on, on trying to collect this money that he would, that he would have done it. Uh, that he could have, that he would have prevailed. Jefferson still didn't want to do it, um, so it remained in sort of in limbo for a few years, and then the litigation began again, and it finally uh, went to the Supreme Court, and they decided in favor of the European claimants. And by then, the interesting thing is that after Jefferson died, his grandson tried to get that money. He had contracted contacted the administrator, and said that he would like to get that bequest revived to save some of Jefferson's slaves from the auction block. Uh, yes, sir, you had a question. Yes. 
Yes. Does deism inform Does deism inform Jefferson's actions? Yes. In his um, uh, inaugural address, his I can't recall if it's the first or the second. He said that he refers to providence, which was one of the words that the, the deists used to refer to God. He said that providence had shown its approval for the, in, the American enterprise by the, the prosperity that was evident in America at that time. He said that you could judge the workings of the judge, you could, you could figure out the, the judgment of God by how prosperous you were. And on his own farm, on his own plantation, he said that, that Providence had smiled on him because the, his black population was increasing. He said that Providence has made my duties and my interests coincide with the birth of these people. So, um, yes, Birch. Oh, that's right. He was asking um, what what accomplishments Jefferson wanted on his tombstone, and I'd be very embarrassed if I can't remember. No, he said he was the author of the Declaration of the Independence, the author of the Statute of Virginia for Religious Freedom, and the father of the University of Virginia. He omitted uh, his service as vice president and president, secretary of state, uh, and, and everything else. It's, and his scholars have kind of puzzled over that. Uh, in uh, you know e ever after, why did he leave out the fact that he was president? The importance of the university. Oh, the importance of the university and the statute for religious freedom. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that the army will always object to the people who are in the Washington. Over which Washington presided. Washington. Yes. Uh, it's a very good question. She said that the, the, I mentioned that the army that Washington led during the revolution was integrated. Uh, and she meant, says that, um, that slaves got citizenship for serving and when did that stop? That, uh, the citizenship for service was, uh, was an offer that was briefly on the table towards the end of the war but it needed the approval of the legislatures of Georgia and South Carolina. And, and they refused to back it. And that's what led Washington to write that letter about how the, pub, the public interest is you now washed over by the private interest. In Virginia, slaveholders were allowed to send substitutes, s send slaves as substitutes to the army, but they had to promise to free those slaves at the end of the war. Some of them, so, some of the of the masters reneged on that promise, and they were denounced in Virginia. And actually, the General Assembly in Virginia specifically passed laws emancipating some slaves who had served in the war as their master's substitutes. However, some there was one slave. I wrote about this in the Washington book. Um, James, uh, the name will come to me. Uh, uh, James Armistead Lafayette, who later he later took Lafayette's name. He was he. Uh, served as a spy in, in Lafayette's army, but he was then he was re-enslaved after the war, and it was only many years later, when Lafayette was on a tour in Virginia, that he found out about the the, the 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 that this man was still a slave, and he raised such a ruckus that the legislature um, freed him. So, but after the war, as I said, this revolutionary fervor among the the, the owners really died out, and uh, the, the the fervor for freeing slaves. It, it, it very quickly passed. So, uh, oh, oh we, in right field. Oh yes, Michael. It was the first. Well, I, I'm not sure if it's the first time in history. But in the 1600s, when Virginia, and I don't know what Maryland did, Virginia began writing its slave codes, it, it said that um, the condition of, a, of an infant, the legal, the legal status of an infant would be, de oh, he was asking if this is the first time that children were en enslaved. Um, the legal status of, of, a, of, a, of a newborn would, f would follow that of the mother. The 
the, the centuries old English legal tradition had been that the condition of the, of the child, or the status of the child followed that of the father. But they had to undo that over here in, uh, you know, in this hemisphere because it would completely derange the racial system, it would derange the inheritance of property uh, because if a black woman gave birth to a, the, the, the son of a white landowner, that son would by law inherit what the white man had, and we couldn't have that. So they, they changed the law. So, yes, ma'am. She's asking me if, uh, how much, how I can compare Virginia and Maryland where situations the same or different. There are some similarities, but I've learned enough about the writing of history that if you don't specialize in something, keep your mouth shut. So. <laughs> Uh, I really have not studied um, Maryland history nor the history of the Eastern Shore, of slavery in the Eastern Shore in, in, in sufficient detail to say anything that would be of any use to you. So, um, <laughs> and I don't want to get myself in trouble. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, two questions. Okay. Uh, first one is, how do your critics refute your evidence? Let me rephrase that. How do my critics attempt to refute my evidence? <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, and was there a second part? Yeah, it's completely okay, all right, well, all right, well, we may have to come back to you then. Um, when, so when I first came across the quotations from Jefferson about the, that when he wrote in that profit and loss memo, it's a page long, mem more than a page, it's in the Library of Congress, uh, I, f I came across it, I, I won't tell you how I came across it, but it's online. And where he says that uh, you know my, my black population increases four percent a year, and then I linked that with this quotation saying to his neighbor, "Invest in Negroes." It's a silent profit. I sent that information to Cinder Stanton, who's a longtime friend of mine, who's the recently retired head. She was not then retired head historian at Monticello, and I said, "What do you think about this?" And I wasn't trying to shove it in her face. I was trying to say, you know, you're the expert. How do we explain this? And she said, well, sometimes he had to talk like that, but in person he was compassionate and generous. And I thought, well, that seems a good definition of hypocrisy. Um, <laughs> but they really had no answer for it. And what in her writings, she emphasizes the, the upfront compassion and generosity. The other thing that really upset her is that I found that, and some, I may have mentioned this in my last speech here, um, when I began doing my research, I used a, a book that's called Jefferson's Farm Book, which reproduces the original ledger and uh, over almost 500 pages of transcripts of documents and letters. And this is what all the scholarship on Monticello has been based on for 60 years. It was published in the early 1950s. And uh, now it's beginning to change in the last 10 years because more and more documents are being published in a new, a new edition. There was a letter in there in which his, his, his son-in-law, Colonel Randolph, reports to him that everything at the nail factory, which employs little boys from 10 to 16, is going very well, very smoothly, nobody's being whipped. Well, in the, in the new version of that, the, the complete transcription, which was published in 2005, a missing line appeared as if by magic. And the letter actually ends, nobody is being whipped except the small ones, for truancy. So this guy, this Monticello scholar, had omitted the line and thereby reverse the meaning of the of the document. And I mentioned this in a lecture at in Charlottesville and my friend Cinder was sitting in the audience and she challenged me on that and it turned out she'd never seen the original the full original document. So all of her scholarship was based on this sanitized version. Uh, and so quite naturally she's unhappy with me because I've turned something up that she can't refute. Something um, you know when you work long enough at Mon I, you know, th th these, I love all of those folks. They have done incredible work, but you know they work for him. It and it really. Be I felt it too. I had a resident fellowship there, for uh, you know uh, the better part of a year, and you feel the aura, you feel the sense of obligation and gratitude to him. All of the money that you're getting comes from him. Or, you know that. It's his library, it's his books, it's his knowledge, it's his mansion you're writing about. So you become very reluctant to think bad thoughts, even in the middle of the night. You know? uh, <laughs> so 
and when I presented this information, it's, this is not stuff that I'm making up. I mean, I presented documents. They absolutely refuse to read what's in front of them. They say it can't mean that. I say, well, it does. So, anyway, um, yes. 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 The question is, did the blacks who fought in the revolution fight alongside whites? Was it truly an integrated army? That was Washington's goal, and he achieved it. Um, he issued an order. He began, the, 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 the army was integrated from the very first days in Cambridge in 1775. Uh, and I go into this in detail in, the, in, the, in the, my book on George Washington. It's a really a fascinating process because Washington first excluded blacks. And then the, the, the soldiers came to headquarters and complained. As he said, they complained very much about being discarded. Uh, and he could sense that these people were patriots and they wanted to serve the American cause. And so he reversed himself. And from that moment, the army was integrated. It, it began to, the, the number of African Americans began to increase dramatic, dramatically um, after Valley Forge because white recruitment was falling so drastically. Uh, one of his officers came to him and said, look, I can raise a good number of black troops in New England. And Washington said, please, go right ahead and do it. Uh, and then more and more black men began coming in. And Washington issued an order that the, that the black men were not to be put all together in, in single units, but were to be dispersed through the army. He said that he wanted to erase even the appearance of a colored corps. Uh, so I think that he knew that there would be trouble, or there could be trouble if all the African Americans were grouped in one place. So, and it was fully integrated. After that, there were blacks in every American army, but they were always segregated. It wasn't until Vietnam that we had an integrated army. Yes, miss. Do you think that any of Jefferson's reluctance to replace um, the Smith Army had a role in the kinship ties to those slaves? Do I think that his reluctance to free slaves had anything to do with kinship ties to those slaves? That is a very, very good question. Uh, no, because uh, a couple of years, no, I, I mean, uh, no, I, just a quick answer. I'm not trying to brush you off. No, um, a couple of years later, in 1822, he allowed two of Sally Hemings children, who were his children, to run away from the plantation, the, old, the two oldest children, Beverly, the, a son, and a male Beverly, and Harriet. Uh, he g gave his overseer 50 bucks to hand to Harriet so that she could pay coach fare to go north. Um, and they disappeared into the white world and were never heard from again by, we have no record of them. Um, and then after, he, in his will, he freed his other two children by Sally Hemings, Madison and Eston, both of them were sons. Um, so he did, f he did free his four blood children. Um, but you raise a very interesting question because one of the things that puzzled me in, in researching this is that, is that how and why his relationship with Sally Hemings did not soften his attitudes towards black people in general. Rather, his attitudes hardened as he grew older, and his comments grew nastier. Uh, and I, I think perhaps it is because as he grew more defensive about, uh, uh, about, about slavery. But um, anyway, I hope that answers your question. Um, yes, ma'am. How much was driven by debt? Never having enough money, yeah, he seemed right. Well, I argue in the book uh, that the issue of Jefferson's debt has been greatly exaggerated. Uh, and I say, let's look at the results. Uh, and first of all, in the 1790s, he, Jefferson himself seemed to feel that he had gotten his, his indebtedness under control. He still complained about it, but he began taking on that extra $2,000 debt to expand, to expand agricultural operations and to expand his mansion. Uh, so. As I said, you know, I've, I've said before, debt never stopped Jefferson from doing anything that he wanted to do. He built Monticello twice. When he would finished doing that, he built another mansion. He built Poplar Forest, which is a magnificent but smaller place outside of Lynchburg, Virginia. And then he invested $30,000, a huge sum of money, in a mill and canal at the foot of Monticello Mountain. Um, we, you know, we often hear about his expenditures on fancy foods and, and, and wine and art and and other things like that. Put that aside. I mean, he lived like a pharaoh. I mean, his, 
the, these building projects were immense. I mean, he lived in one of the biggest and grandest mansions in the United States and then built another one. Uh, so, you know, as I said, debt never, he always complained about it, but he just kept going and going and going on a grand scale. And I had some conversations with another expert at, at Monticello about this who studied the financial records very closely, as I had. And I went to him and I said, Billy, I see a whole pattern of him constantly refinancing, constantly finding new sources of credit, um, getting loans from, from the banks. Uh, there were notes from people saying, I would never call a loan on the man who wrote the author of the Declaration of Independence. I said, I don't see him troubled by his debt. And this man, Billy Wason, who's not only a PhD, he's a man in his 60s, he's also a farmer. He said, Henry, you're absolutely right. He was a financial genius. Uh, he kept everything going, and, er and, and everything actually was going well. His finances were under control until 1820, when he stupidly co-signed a promissory note for an in-law who had invested very heavily in real estate in Kentucky and was about to lose his land because there was a $20,000 payment due. Jefferson co-signed a note for that $20,000 and his in-law immediately went bankrupt. So Jefferson himself was on the hook for that $20,000. And he was on the hook to people who were not patient because most of the money he owned was to members of his own family and people who would never call a note on him. These guys were real estate guys. And so <laughs> things, things very quickly got very gloomy. Uh, and that's really what sank him, was that $20,000 note. So uh, over here, yes, Smith. That's one of the central questions. What do I make of his hypocrisy in mixing black and white blood and um, you know, having children one of, with one of his own slaves? That, that to me remains a central mystery about, about the man. And uh, you know, he, he so emphatically spoke against the mixing of the races throughout his life that it, for a while it led me to doubt that he could possibly have had children with Sally Hemings. You know, how could a man who says these things actually have himself mixed, mixed race children? I couldn't understand it. And as I mentioned before, the, f um, the fact that he had uh, African American blood kin did not soften his attitudes. You know, one of the points of disagreement between, between me and Annette Gordon Reed, one of the things I, I think uh, really irks her, is that I completely disagree with her portrait of the relationship between Jefferson and Hemings. Um, I think that there was a sexual relationship, but I think that he was an emotionally distant and even brutal man. If you look, I think if you look honestly at the memoir, the 2000 word memoir that his son Madison Hemings dictated in 1873, you find a, a, a memoir of abandonment and loss. You found a man who ha has nothing, very little to say about his father, has no story. He lived, he lived with him for over 20 years, and he has no upfront stories. He, never, he doesn't recount a single conversation, a single thing that his father ever said to him. Um, and it, he said his, 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 that Jefferson was not in the habit of giving us any fatherly attention at all, and he could see him doting on his white grandchildren, but not on his black children. Uh, and Annette sort of turns this around and said, well, they had quality time away from the, f the, uh, the white family at Poplar Forest. And I, said, I thought, well, why didn't Madison mention that? He would have. Um, so I think that, um, you know, his t partially answer your question, he separated himself emotionally from, the, 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 from, his, from his black kin. Um, I also think, and I, it was, this, is, this is speculative, so, so speculative that I didn't put it into the book, but I think that his, his attitude towards black people changed fundamentally when his wife died in 1782 because the Hemingses, including Sally Hemings, were related to, Je were Je Jefferson's wife brought six Hemings half-siblings. They, they, Sally Hemings was, was the half-sister of Jefferson's wife, which a lot of people don't know. I mean, that Jefferson's wife... Je the father of Jefferson's wife, John Wales, had six children with Betty Hemings. All of those children became Jefferson slaves and worked at Monticello. So Sally Hemings was Martha uh, Wales, Jefferson's uh, half-sister. And when she died, when Martha Wales, Jefferson died in 1782, Jefferson lost 
this bridge between himself and his black kin. Uh, and he, he was left sort of high and dry with all of these black relatives who had a claim on him. They had a kinship claim. And at various points, you can see his irritation with these black relatives for asserting themselves. Uh, he got very angry with Martin Hemings uh, and, and sold him. He got very angry with James and Robert for asking to be set free, and he negotiated with them and, and wrote, um, he wrote a very um, angry and bitter document uh, about Robert's. He, he said that, that Robert's new owner had debauched him from, from me, and, and uh, he complained about when he set James free, he complained in the document that he had spent a lot of money on training this man. Uh, and th you think that he would have the good graces to, you know, to let his, his relatives go, but he, uh, he was quite angry with them. And I think it's because his wife was not there anymore to serve as a buffer between him and his, bl and his black kin. And, I, and as I said, I think that the, the hold, the influence that they had, the Hemingses had over him because of the kinship really irritated him uh, and caused this, part may have caused the hardening of his attitudes, but that's just my speculation. Are there any other student, go ahead. Are there any other student questions first? Yes, go ahead. Oh, yes. All right. Uh, thank you for bringing it up. He said the book has been controversial in academic scholarly circles, but what's the reaction in the broader community? That, it's actually incorrect to say that it's been controversial in scholarly. It's controversial with the Monticello crowd, and they've made a lot of noise. There are other scholars um, who are, have spoken very favorably about the book, including Jacqueline Jones, who is one of the premier historians of slavery, won the Bancroft Prize for her study of Savannah. She teaches at the University of Texas. T.H. Uh, um, Breen, who's the author of a book called The Tobacco Coast, one of the, one of the seminal studies of the, or, of the or origins of Virginia, wrote a very favorable review in, a, in American Scholar. But the Monticello people, who are numerous and very loud, have made a lot of noise. And, and much of their, I mean, they repeat each other's arguments. I mean, they've, they, um, and, and I have gone online and refuted them. And uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, I, had a, um, I was asked to go to the Miller Center at the University of Virginia and sit for a 70-minute conversation with a, you know, with a questioner who sort of took me through all of the major complaints, and I answered all of them. And that's online. If you do a search for my name in Miller Center, you'll find that, and it will, um, it's more interesting than the NCAA playoffs if you want to watch, <laughs> want to watch a video. So anyway, another. I think what, one more question I'll take from a student. If we have one, they take priority. Or ma'am, in the back, you have a question? Yeah, uh, just listening to the conversation of um, Jefferson being sort of dishonest and deceptive, but given the institution of slavery and what it meant to America, could he really be otherwise? Was there anybody else who was open and not an exception of, of slaves and their children and I mean I, I, I can't find an example of somebody who could be open. Was it allowed? What would have happened to him in America if that, he said, Yes, these are my children, I love them. Right. Come and accept that. That's a very good question. She asks, I mean, uh, you know, Jefferson comes across as a very, you know, dishonest and deceptive person for not acknowledging his children. Is there anyone else at that time who was coming forward? Um, a few did. You're absolutely right. It was not the norm for uh, slave owners to come forward in, uh, and or recognize their children. But in, the, in my uh, book, The Hairstons, An American Family in Black and White, I tell the story of a, a very, very wealthy white landowner uh, from, who fled, more or less fled Virginia because he had an argument with his very equally wealthy wife about what to do over slavery. He had grown to hate it, and he'd actually secretly freed slaves and send them, sent them to Africa. Uh, he went first to Europe and then returned to, a, to New Orleans, went to New Orleans and then went to Mississippi where he had large holdings. There he had a relationship with a slave in which, and she gave birth to a child and when he was on his deathbed he called in a lawyer. He, it said that this six-year-old slave girl is my child. I set her free and I give her my entire estate. She inherited 
an estate in land, slaves, and cash worth over a million dollars in 1852. Um, his family didn't like it. <laughs> so, forever after, they said he was insane. They said he was crazy. So, shall we end there? Okay, I guess we have to stop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.